So it's a privilege and an honor to be given the opportunity to uh, fill in for Rick as he's recovering very gracefully, as he already showed us, from his shoulder surgery. Um, I love the opportunity to preach, but I, I have to apologize a little bit because I'm used to speaking while I'm on loud ships or out in the middle of the field somewhere. So if for some reason you feel as if I'm yelling at you. I'm not. I'm used to speaking with young sailors and marines, so I'm trying to come across forcefully, but if I hear myself doing it, I'll tone it down a little bit, and I'll be looking to the other chaplains and be like, hey, calm it down, okay? So we're going to discuss suffering for the second week, because we're moving on with this idea of the culture wars, and we're going to talk about suffering for a second time, and you might be thinking, why in the world two times? Why in the world go into it again? And here's why. Suffering is one of the number one reasons that people either struggle in their faith or never come to faith. And it's the number one thing that the world a lost and dying world who hates the things of God, it's the number one thing they use to say, ha, we got you. How in the world could this good and loving God that you talk about take my daughter? How could this good and loving God that you talk about take my mother early? How could he give me cancer? How could he make me lose my job? No way. And we struggle with that ourselves because we're not immune to that, are we? We suffer just as much, even though we look to Christ and we say, He is my Savior, He is my Lord, He is my everything. We still struggle, and we still suffer. And we need to focus on why we go through these things and how we can come through these sufferings because it's very, very important. So that's why we're focusing on it for a second week. Another reason we're focusing on it for a second week. The church, and I don't mean this as me saying this to you. I'm saying this to myself. I'm saying this whole sermon to myself. And all you got to do is ask my family and my extended family. I struggle and I suffer and I have a hard time dealing with it. So I'm preaching this for me. You guys, it's great that you're here. Thank you. But, you know... If you weren't here, I just put up a mirror and, and, and speak to myself. So, another reason why we're focusing on for a second week suffering, the church sometimes stops at simple platitudes or cliche sayings that we mean with a good heart and we mean with love, but honestly, they're very shallow and they don't help too much. And this is what I mean. You're going through something deep and meaningful and very impactful and hard in your life. And usually the response we get is what? God has a plan. Jesus loves you. Fantastic truths. I'm not knocking those things at all. But sometimes we stop right there. The Bible has rich depth about why we're going through those things that's much more than just, because like I said, I've I'm preaching this for me, and you'll hear some about my story. I go, and this is someone who I've been to college, I've been to seminary for four years. I mean, I think about this, it's my job, this is all I do, think about these things and talk about these things, and yet I still go, God has a plan. What exactly does that mean? You know, Jesus loves me. I really don't feel the love right now. Mm -mm. God, through his scripture, says, I will save you from that shallowness. There is depth in why we go through suffering. And God says, I will tell you why you are going through it. So that's another reason we're focusing for two weeks in a row on suffering. Last reason. In American Christianity especially, we have this notion that suffering is a temporary thing. I don't mean temporary like 85 years and then we're on to glory. That's, that's not what I mean. If, if you're talking about temporary like that, then yeah, it is a temporary thing. But for most of us, we think about suffering as, that was a hard day, but God's going to bless me tomorrow. Right? 
Or that was a tough week, and that's the end of it. Or that was a tough month, and that's the end of it. Or that was a tough year, but that's the end of it. If God asks one more day of me, no way. I'm going to argue from Scripture that's a wrong notion to have. And let me say it again. I'm not saying you guys are wrong. I'm saying this to myself because uh, I'm, I'm a young guy. At least I kind of still like to think I'm young while I have some hair on my head. And the ages keep on you know, creeping up in the years. And I'm 32, but I feel young. So I'm young, right? Okay, I'm young. Um, when, I was, when I was 27, our first child was born. Isabella, and you might have seen her running around like a crazy maniac. I blame that on her mother. <laughs> Isabella was born. Isabella was born about eight weeks premature. You know, we, we, we were out in the, the hills of Virginia where we went to college, and we, we came back, and Annie said, I think something's wrong. Let's go to the hospital. And I said, oh, I'm sure nothing's wrong. But we went to the hospital anyway, and we get there, and the doctor says, uh, you're about to have this baby. And my world fell apart. Right? This is, this is eight weeks early. This is not okay. This is early, this is early November. Baby's not due till the end of December. What's going on here? And you hear, as many of your mothers are shaking your heads, because you know what that means. The lungs might not be developed. We've got to get some steroid shots in there. We've got to see if the baby's going to make it. Oh, no, my world's falling apart. And that's a very serious thing. But I thought, as Isabella was fine, and she was born, and she stayed in the NICU for a while, but she was okay, I thought, that's my moment of suffering. I have read about this in my seminary classes. I have thought about this in my, in my, my prayer, in my thinking life with God, and talking about theology. Ha-ha, I've had my moment of suffering. Now I can really understand it. And then in 2010, I was on my first deployment in, on a ship, a little small ship in the Middle East, and we pulled into port, which is basically the only time you're able to talk to your family. And I called Annie, and she said, I've got bad news. Our daughter hadn't been developing with her uh, milestones and everything. And my wife had to tell me over the phone that our daughter had autism, a lifelong disability that was never going to be fixed. You don't take a, a shot. You don't take a pill. Lifelong. And in that moment, I, I would love to tell you, I triumphed through my faith in Christ. I was devastated, and I was down low, and I was depressed. And I started to feel the weight that my idea that we only have a light momentary suffering and affliction is a wrong idea. And not just because I had an aha moment, but because it's contrary to Scripture as we'll see. We suffer. But it's not like the world says. You suffer because you lost the lottery. You suffer because that guy was a jerk. You suffer because he shouldn't have drunk and drive. You suffer because that's just the way it is. No. God says, I have a deep, rich, meaningful purpose in your suffering. And it's not because... I've lost my sovereignty, and it's not because I don't love you. Because I love you, you suffer. So that's what we're going to look at. And I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe you've had a traumatic experience in your life where you've said, there is no way I can faithfully turn to God and love Him with what I've been through. And the only reason I'm here this morning is because this is what I do. I was raised this way. I get up on Sunday morning and I go to church and I sit there and I sing the songs, but there's no love in here. And if that's you, I would say listen to the words of God as He says, I have good plans for you. We read about it in Jeremiah. I have good plans for you and they're plans to prosper you even through the midst of your suffering, okay? Or you might be going through it right now. I'm in the midst of it. I just found out that the cancer is there. I just found out that my child did this. I just found out that I lost my job, whatever it is. And you don't know what to do. I would say, listen to the words of Matthew 7 as Jesus says, plant your 
house your tree of faith upon what? Solid rock. Because the storm is coming. And as a little sidebar, do you guys ever, we, we talk about Matthew 7 all, all the time, right? Build your house upon a rock, not upon the sand. Because if you build it upon the sand, what happens to the house? It falls down. And that's, that's the point of the parable. It's very, very true. But have you also considered this? Which house does the storm hit? Both of them. Okay? So don't think for a second just because, hey, my house is on the rock. It's going to be sunny days and everything's fine like it is in Southern California. No, it's going to be like two weeks ago, last week, when we had the storm of the century, which, which my wife and I were laughing about because they were talking on the news about how do you get through seasonal depression in Southern California because there was two days of rain. So, so if you're going through it right now, I would say listen to the words of Matthew 7. Build your house upon Christ as your sure foundation and your house will hold up in the midst of the storm, okay? Or if you're young, or you've lived a fantastic life somehow, and you're thinking that suffering stuff is for other people, it's not for me, I would say, look forward to Matthew 7. Build your house there, because, and talk to anybody here, what would you advise those people? Hold on, it's coming. There's no way around it. It's coming. And what we're going to see today, it's coming because God has a very specific purpose in putting us through suffering. It is not because he has taken his love away from us. It is not because he's surrendered his supreme sovereignty over the world. No, he has a very specific purpose in putting us through our suffering. Okay? We're going to jump out of 2 Timothy for a little bit to drive home this idea of why do we suffer. And to do that, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. So it should be up on the screen. Oh, can you guys, okay, that TV's bigger, but it's pretty small. Maybe I'm not as young as I thought. So I'm going to read it out of my Bible. I'm going to read it out of my Bible, and then I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to explain it backwards to four because the main verse we're going to focus on is 24, okay? So read the screen or the Bible's in front of you. Paul's saying in 1 Colossians 1, starting in verses 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Okay, Paul's dealing with the ministry of getting the gospel out to the Gentile peoples. Starting at 29, remember we're going backwards. Paul is toiling and struggling with all his energy. Verse 29. Why is he doing this? 28, to present everyone mature in Christ, and he's seeking to do this by proclaiming and warning and teaching everyone. Well, what is he teaching them? He is teaching them Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he calls this a mystery that was hidden but is now being revealed. We know this as the gospel, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he says, this is a mystery. And when we hear the word mystery, we shouldn't think something that cannot be known. Instead, we should think something that was previously unknown, but is now being revealed. I reveal the mystery of how I do this trick to you. Paul is saying, the mystery of Christ that was unknown to you is now being revealed. All right? Verse 25. It is for this, the revealing of the mystery, that Christ in you, the hope of glory to the Gentile peoples, it is for this that he became a minister according to the stewardship of God. And what does this ministry cost him? Verse 24, and this will be our main focus. Now I rejoice in my sufferings 
for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, that is the church. We're going to focus on that line where he says, in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Because that's a little confusing, Paul. For a split second, and if I you know, didn't have the rest of scripture, I would say, hey, Paul sounds a little heretical there. Obviously he's not, so what else is going on? What in the world is Paul talking about when he says, in my flesh I am filling up what is, what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, what is Paul saying? It's easiest when you start off with what he is not saying. Paul is obviously not saying that there's anything lacking in the atoning worth or value of Christ's sufferings upon the cross. And you should ask me, how do we know that? Well, pretty easy. Go up a couple verses. Verse 21 in chapter 1, Paul says, And you, talking to the people in, uh, that he's writing the book to, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind and doing evil deeds. He's painting the picture of lost people, right? Hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He, Christ, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Christ's death upon the cross has completely covered their sins, right? Paul is not saying there's anything lacking in the atoning worth or value of Christ's sufferings upon the cross. So get that idea out of your mind. But we still have our question, don't we? What is Paul talking about? Because it's still confusing. What does he mean by he's filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ? Well, I could say, you know, hey, if we look at the Greek, but I won't do that. We don't need a Greek lesson here. I will say, there's only one other place in Scripture, in the New Testament, where that phrase, fill up what is lacking, is seen. And if we go there, I think we will have a good idea of what Paul is actually talking about. So if you have a Bible, turn it one page back or look on the screen to Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. And let me set the stage for you, okay? Paul is writing to the Philippian church during his imprisonment in Rome uh, around the year 8060, okay? He's writing to them because they have sent something, a gift to Paul, and he's writing back to the church to thank them, to encourage them, and this is what he says. I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger, your minister, as you ministered to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because, he heard that he, because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. And here we go. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete or fill up to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So we see that same kind of phraseology. To complete or to fill up what was lacking in your service to me. What was lacking in the Philippian church's service to Paul? Because this is what has happened. The Philippian church has heard. Paul's imprisoned in Rome. This is Paul the man who founded this church during his second missionary journey. We must help him. We must support him. We must give him something. Money, books, whatever it was. We want to bless him with our love and our care for him. So this is what they say. Let us come together and let us go give this gift to Paul 600 miles to the west in Rome. Well, there's too many of us for all of us to go. And the journey's too long and too dangerous for all of us to go. So what do they do? They say, Epaphroditus, represent us and take this 
to Paul in Rome. And that's what Epaphroditus does. And Paul says, in so doing, Epaphroditus filled up what was lacking in the church's service to Paul. Well, what was lacking? Was anything lacking in the spirit of the gift? No. Was anything lacking in the heart and love from which the gift came? No. So what was lacking? The personal presentation of the gift. They all couldn't go. It was too far. It was too dangerous. They wouldn't make it. So they said, we have a lack there. Epaphroditus, fill that lack up for us. Paul says, I have, he has filled up that lack through going the 600 miles, through going through the dangerous territory, and has presented that gift to Paul. And Paul says, he has filled up what was lacking in your service to me. The only thing that was lacking was the personal presentation of the gift to Paul in Rome. Do you see that? Let's go back to Colossians now, okay? Colossians 1, 24, I'll read it again. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Paul is not saying there's anything lacking in the atoning worth, the value, the sacrifice, the love from which Christ died upon the cross. Nothing's lacking. So what is it? Remember what is Paul, what is Paul doing? He's presenting and ministering to Gentile peoples who never knew about this Jesus. What Paul's saying is the only thing that is lacking is the personal presentation of those sufferings to a lost and dying world who are hearing about Christ for the first time. Now we heard about the sufferings of Paul last week, didn't we? He was shipwrecked. He was suffering from famine. He was hunger, naked, all these things, right? He suffered a lot. He was whipped multiple times. Paul's making the point that when he suffers in his life, he is doing so so that the people he's ministering to, the people he is loving, when they see him suffering and the way that he deals with his suffering by having his foundation upon Christ, when they see him doing that, they say, I only heard the words about this suffering of Christ, but now I see them in and through your suffering. The sufferings of Christ become present to them, face to face. And Paul says, in so doing, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions because I'm making them present to these people. Christ died once, right? Christ is only dying once, and he did it thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago, right? That's never happening again. So as we go and we live our life and we witness and we tell people and we love on people with the love of Christ and should we ever expect them to see physically, face-to-face, -face, the sufferings of Christ ever again? No! We live 2,000 years later. It's never going to happen. How are they going to see it? How are they going to feel it? How are they going to know it? In and through our suffering, the sufferings of Christ become visible and present to them. Do you see that? It has a profound effect on what it means that you have cancer. It has a profound effect on what it means when you open your mouth and speak the gospel to someone. They point at you. They laugh at you. They say you're stupid and ignorant for believing such things. It has a profound effect of, what do you mean my, my daughter's never going to be okay? What is Paul saying? In and through his sufferings, he makes present, visible the sufferings of Christ. That's what Paul's saying. What does it mean for us? Um, first, to the, to the non-believer. For you, I would say it's, it's a call. This 
this right now is a call. Christ has suffered for you. He has loved you. He has poured out his blood upon the cross that you might know him. Not just in an intellectual way. Yeah, I'm sure Christ lived, you know, A.D. 30, A.D. 0, all those years in between. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he lived and he physically was there. No, that you might know him, that you might repent from your sin and grasp upon him in faith and say he has covered my sin and now I know him as my Savior. This is a call that you might do that. Have faith in him. And you might sit there and say, yeah, right. Because that thing you just said about why we suffer, I've never seen that. I see Christians living just like me. I see Christians, when they hear bad news, they react just like me. I see Christians, when they lose their job or whatever happens, the way they react, just like me. They might say they live and they have their foundation upon Christ, upon Christ but they have the same values, the same foundation that I do. So why should I believe in this Christ? I would say we are wrong in doing that. We have lived the shallowness. This is me here, okay? Like I said, I'm preaching this to me. We have lived the shallowness of not having a deep, rich, rooted faith that says, upon Christ I will have my foundation and through my suffering people will see his love and see my dependence upon him. We are wrong in that, but don't use that as a blocking thing from coming to faith. This is a call right now that your sufferings are meant to bring you to God. They are meant to bring you to faith in Christ. And that when that happens for you, when you see that, when you open your eyes to the reality of his presence, those sufferings become worth it because they have hooked you on to the reality of your existence, that you were made to know God and experience him through the gospel. This is a call, and before you there is a road that splits, and one, you can stay on your own path, and you can keep on doing what you've always been doing, but it leads to a place of destruction and despair, and there is no escaping that. And the other leads to fulfillment. The other leads to this is my purpose. The other leads to love. The other leads to I am bathed in the blood of Christ. And this is all I've ever wanted. Pay attention to the call. Non-Christians. Believers that are here. You, I mean, you hear me already saying it, so I'm going to say it again, you know. Uh, one of my favorite preachers always says, if there's something really important, say it and say it again, you know. Think of new ways to say it, but keep on saying it. So I'm going to keep on saying it. Why do we go through suffering? What I'm going to say is, it's the plan. Don't be shocked by it. I'm not saying that's easy. A lot of times it's really, really hard. But the way it becomes easier is when you realize, wait a second, this is for my good that as I go forth into my community and say, no, you should not abort your children just because it's not convenient for you. And they look at me and say, why are you trying to hold people down? It's a, Roman, it's a woman's right to choose. Let her do whatever she wants. Stop bringing your 1950 morals on us. You say, it's worth it to feel like I'm an idiot. It's worth it to have people call me names. It's worth it to be so angry because why can't they just see? It's worth it because I'm going through this pain. I'm going through this suffering because the way I react to it, I need to react to it in, in love and dependence upon Christ and knowing through my reaction to what they say, they might see the love and the sufferings of Christ. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, they might be changed. Right? Suffering is the plan. I don't know if you've thought about it like that. Hopefully you have. We will suffer in our Christian life. 
I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's worth it. Because when we suffer with a dependence upon Christ and Him as our foundation, the lost and dying world sees the sufferings of Christ. And the gospel that comes out of our mouth is not just words anymore, but it's real and it's visible and it's palpable before them. And the Holy Spirit uses that to change their hearts. Okay? Look at your suffering like that. Remember, I'm preaching to me. This isn't easy. I'm preaching to me. So if I'm pumped up, it's because I'm pumped up. Okay. What is Paul saying? What does it mean for us? Finally. How do we do it? Because if I just leave you there, then it's like, all right, I'm really pumped up, but I don't, how do, uh, okay. How do we do it? A few different ways. Know your theology. Know, know our theology. Know your theology. What do I mean? Well, I just said what? Suffering is the plan. And since you're a good Berean Christian, you're going, oh yeah, prove it. Here we go. John 15, 20, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. In other places in the gospel, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. What do you think happens to sheep in the midst of wolves? They all don't play nice together. Suffering is the plan. Jesus was setting it up to show us this is part of the Christian life so that as we suffer as the body of Christ, a lost and dying world says, I see it, I feel it, so much more rich and deeper than just hearing it, right? One of my... uh, favorite verses in all of scripture, Matthew, or Matthew, Romans, not even close to Matthew, Romans 8, and I'll read a few verses, Romans 8, starting in verse 28, and I'll skip down a little bit and finish the rest of the chapter, Romans 8, 28, and you know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 31, now, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And up until that point, we go, all things work together for good. I like that. And nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. I like that. And if we're thinking like Americans, we go, that means house in the suburbs, nice white picket fence, 2.5 children, and I'll go mid-sized car in the garage, right? That's what we think. That's working out for my good. That's not what he means at all. Because let's finish the chapter. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is fleshing out what he means in Colossians even more, saying the good that God says, I will make it all work for your good, is that in and through your sufferings, you will see me more. I will become more present to you in your life. I will fill you up in your life. And, and the gospel will go forth because a lost and dying world sees your suffering. And I use that to bring them to faith. 
is there a richer, more meaningful purpose to go through suffering than that God might save people? I'm not telling you to, to, to go look for suffering like an idiot. Well, I jumped in front of the car so I could save people. It's not what I mean. I mean, live your life dedicated to Christ. The suffering will find you, trust me. And the older people in the congregation said, amen. It will find you. And when it comes, face it, praising, glorifying, having your foundation upon your relationship with Christ, and the world will go, there is something different going on there. Know your theology. Two, and I couldn't, I couldn't help but do this, but number two, know your church history. Now, if anyone knows me, they'll say, hey, you slipped that one in. I was a history major in college. I love history. No, I didn't slip it in because you didn't know this, but church history, knowing your church history is biblically mandated. So all of you out there who say, thank God I never have to go to high school again or college again and take my history 101 class that is so boring and I slept through half of it, you're wrong. Okay? Hebrews 13, 7. Remember those who went before you. Remember your leaders. Sorry, I was quoting a different translation. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Church history is mandated. You need to know your church history. Why, though? Because it gives us surety that this is the plan. That God remains faithful. That he's done this before. That we don't live in this vacuum of today. C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia guy, C.S. Lewis said every third book you should read should be outside of your own century. And since obviously we can't read books in the future, they're not here yet, you should read old books by dead people. (laughs) Why? Why? Because when I sit down and read a book by one of the guys we're about to look at, he's writing it from a perspective of the society and the times that he lives in. And it helps me to go, wait a minute, you mean people didn't always think like Western Americans? No. Oh, you mean I don't have to think about these things in this certain milieu that I've grown up with? No, it gives you full body to your experience of faith. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. Okay, so know your church history. Let's see the picture. All right, here we go. It's it's quiz time. No, it's not quiz time, but these are going to help. Does anyone know who the... I I can't ask you who the guy on the left is because, well, it's supposed to be Joseph. We don't know what Joseph looked like. Joseph from, you know, Genesis, right? Right? We don't know what Joseph looked like, but there's a pretty good guess, okay? That's supposed to be Joseph. Why does looking at Joseph and his story help us when we're thinking about why we're suffering in our lives? What happened to Joseph? He's sold by his brothers after they decided not to kill him, because I guess they kind of felt bad about it. They said, well, we'll sell you into slavery. And we read and we go, man, things are going really bad for Joseph. And they are. And then he's bought by Potiphar. And what does he do? He rises in Potiphar's house, and we go, hey, things are turning up. I mean, slavery's terrible, but things are turning up in Potiphar's house. And then what happened? Apparently, Joseph was a young, attractive man, probably like this guy. And Potiphar's wife, hey, how you doing? And he goes, no. And then what happens to Joseph? He's sent to jail, and things are going bad for Joseph again. And he interprets some dreams, and he says, remember me. And it seems like they don't remember him. Right? And things are going bad for Joseph. And then who has a dream? Pharaoh has a dream. There was this guy, I remember, who could interpret that dream. And Joseph is coming to the point after years and years and years of suffering, God places him before Pharaoh. And what does he do? He interprets the dream and he becomes Pharaoh's right hand man. And a famine hits, right? And his family and all of Israel is in trouble. His brothers come to Egypt. And they don't know it's Joseph they're dealing with, but they come to Egypt and they say, we need food. And Joseph realizes who they are. And at the end of all of it, in Genesis 
50, at the end of the book, Genesis 50, verse 20, do you know what Joseph says? After he reveals who he is, and his brothers are like, oh my gosh, we're about to die. Because this guy's really powerful and we sold him into slavery. At the end of the book, Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it. All of my suffering that I've been through, for good. God meant it for good. Why? I mean, well, we, we can look at the history in the Old Testament. God brings the people of Israel into Egypt. And why did he bring them into Egypt? Well, for the famine, yes. But also, I've got a purpose. I'm going to enslave them in Egypt. And they're enslaved. And then what does God do? I'm going to send a deliverer and I'm going to free my people so that, there's a bunch of reasons, but one of them is so that New Testament people like us can look back at the Old Testament and go, you mean, Jesus delivers us from my sin in the same kind of way that God, through Moses, delivered people from their slavery? Yes. Oh. God's working redemptive history for millions and billions of people through the sufferings of Joseph. That's pretty important, right? Yeah. Next guy in the middle. Does anyone know who this is? You win five extra bonus points. And my wife hates it when I do that because the points don't buy you anything. I just accumulate them. You win five extra bonus points. He wrote the second most important Christian book outside the Bible. Pilgrim's Progress. That's John Bunyan. John Bunyan was imprisoned in the 1660s in England. Do you know why he was imprisoned? Because he said, I won't stop preaching the gospel. So they imprisoned him. And he's in prison for 12 years. And while he's there, he writes Pilgrim's Progress. And he gets out. And he tries to get it published. But nothing really happens with it. And he dies before ever knowing what happened from that story. He dies before he ever knew that that 12 years of imprisonment was worth it because what God was doing during that suffering. The last is John Newton. And we sing one of his hymns all the time, right? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And there was a movie recently released a few years ago, Amazing Grace, about William Wilberforce. And I'm going to tie the two together in just a second. But John Newton, when he was a young man, he was the captain of a slave trading vessel. And for the rest of his life, after he became a Christian, after he became a minister, he could never get away from the pain that he caused other people by selling them and transporting them into slavery. His sin and the, suffered he, and the sufferings he, he had because of his sin, he could never get away from it. And he's ministering at a very old age in London. And there's a young parliamentarian who becomes a Christian, an evangelical Christian, which in those days was, ugh, you don't, you don't do that in good society. But he became an evangelical Christian. So he said, well, I need to go talk to the only evangelical Christian I know of, John Newton. And the question he asked him was, should I stay in Parliament? And John Newton said, yes, because you don't know what God has for you there and the work he has for you to do. That young parliamentarian was William Wilberforce, the man who championed the end of the slave trade in England, which in turn brought about the end of the slave trade and slavery in America. The sufferings that John Newton experienced, even because of his own sin, God said, I will use that, I will turn that, I will make that glorify me. The last part, know, know your story. So, we know our theology, we know the story of, of history, now it's Know your story. And what I mean by that is understand you've already experienced this in your life, but we forget so easily. When I was a teenager, I hated Christianity. And I hated my parents for it. And I would physically try to beat up my father all the time. And I got into drugs and gangs and all these other things 
And God saved me out of that. And I don't say that as like a, oh, look what God did. But he saved me out of that. And now when I sit with young Marines and sailors who are struggling with their anger or they're struggling with the addictions that they have or they're struggling with other things, I'm able to have some kind of an experience of what they're going through. God has redeemed my suffering through that, that I caused myself. Know your story. I said it before. The worst day of my life so far. I'm 32, I know that. The worst day of my life so far was having a crappy cell phone connection, hearing my wife tell me that my daughter had a lifelong disability, and being half the world away and being able to do nothing about it. Because as a father's in the room, you know this, you'll do anything to save your kids from pain and suffering. And I couldn't do a thing. And I struggle with that every day. And I struggle through the pain of, why is this happening? And the only way, the only way it's worth it is if through the pain that she experiences and the pain that my wife and I experience as we talk to other people who have disabled children, or we talk to other people and they see how we deal with it, is that one day they might be in glory because my daughter has a disability. All right? Suffering is worth it if we look to Christ and say, how do we reflect his glory? How do we reflect his sufferings in and through our own sufferings to a lost and dying world? If we do that, people will come to faith. Our suffering will be worth it. You will be satisfied and God will be glorified. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for an opportunity to uh, speak your word. I, I thank you for uh, w what it means to me to be able to do it. We ask that uh, in our pain and our struggling and our suffering, you might be glorified. And the way that we deal with it might be having our foundation firmly upon you so that others might come to faith and knowing you and that we might be strengthened in our experience of you to be able to make it through the dark days. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your sovereignty. And we thank you that you are for us, even in the midst of the pain and the suffering. We pray this all in Jesus' name.